People are watching in the plenary feed rooms. You can all ignore me here. People are watching in the other rooms where the video is being fed. There's, I see at least 20 or 30 seats in here if you would prefer a live show to a video feed show. Talk to the other room so you can ignore me. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Good morning. Welcome to Seattle. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Thank you all for coming uh, on this terrible day for a conference. It's uh, so beautiful out. Um, and of course, on this very beautiful day, we provided you with um, umbrellas. So, being that people in law school IT don't waste hardware, they repurpose it. This is not an umbrella. This is actually a meteor shield. <laughs> you had to know that two weeks ago a meteor fell in yeah. Seattle. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right. Let me start by thanking some of the people that made this conference possible. And what I mean by that is uh, our, our, our sponsors. I want to thank LexisNexis and Thompson West. I want to thank BNA, Aspen, ExamSoft, Extegrity, Software Secure, and the Scheidler Center for hosting this conference. Thank you very much, folks. <laughs> I especially want to thank our hosts here, which is the University of Washington School of Law. Um, I'll be more ebullient with my thanks tomorrow. The dean will be here tomorrow to, uh, to welcome us to the conference. Um, but I really appreciate that they've invited us to this unbelievable, magnificent uh, new building that they've only been in for uh, two semesters, as I understand now. Thank you, University of Washington. <laughs> this was an especially difficult conference to plan. And what I mean is um, we do almost all of our correspondence with speakers and with uh, participants via email. And um, I receive Besides all the emails that I receive back and forth about the conference and other things, I receive an awful lot of email um, that doesn't have anything to do with the conference. Um, actually, I receive an awful lot of Dada poetry that comes with the conference. And um, for those of you who don't know what Dada is, um, it's an anti-art movement. According to its proponents, Dada was not art. It was anti-art. For everything that art stood for, Dada was to represent the opposite. Where art was concerned with aesthetics, Dada ignored them. If art is to have at least an implicit or latent message, Dada strives to have no meaning. Interpretation of Dada is dependent entirely on the viewer. 
if art is to appeal to the sensibilities, Dada offends. Now, it turns out that I like Dada poetry, and I wanted to share some of that with you uh, so that you could appreciate it as well. Foggy reality, reluctant commissary. Hmm. Now, it doesn't really work that well. It needs more attitude, doesn't it? Yeah. Try that again. Oh, by the way, that was brought to you by uh, low price software can be had for very low prices. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let's try that again. Poinsettia being a generally decolonize. Here it occurred, deter. The words rushed, Durant's express his protest. Excellent, what a thing. <laughs> That's a little better, but I don't think we've got the attitude right. Um, by the way, that was brought to you by uh, Get a Low Mortgage. Um, Deb, could you help me out with this next one? Sure. And I promise this is the last one. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Extemporaneous at the door, abject his magician. Have craven some hosticking. <laughs> Daphne, a false Dimitri. <laughs> Judicious, hear the administrator. <laughs> Great, thanks, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> that was brought to you by Refinance Today. <laughs> So what is spam? <laughs> it's an anti-email movement. According to its proponents, spam was not email. It was anti-email. For everything that email stood for, spam was to represent the opposite. Where email was concerned with communication, spam ignored them. If email is to have at least an implicit or latent message, spam strives to have no meaning. Interpretation of spam, however, is dependent entirely on the viewer. If email is to appeal to sensibilities, spam offends. Let's take care of some housekeeping now. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, there's going to be a combined CEB Cali author meeting in room 117. Uh, so Cali editorial board meet, uh, members and Cali authors grab your lunch the meeting won't actually start till 12 noon, so you've got about that half hour to grab your lunch and go to that meeting. Uh, Deb and her bongos will be presiding. Um, as a courtesy, set your cell phones to manner mode, please. Buses for the Argosy cruise tonight leave at 6 p.m. from the four conference hotels, two from the University Towers, two from Waterton, two from the University Inn. One will leave from the Silver Cloud and one will leave from the law school. So. If you're at a different hotel or not staying at a hotel, get to one of those locations in order to make it to the Argosy Cruise. Uh, just so that you know, it's a three-hour tour. <laughs> three-hour <laughs> tour. All right, turn that cell phone off. If you want to take a library tour today and tomorrow, there's library tours at 12.30 to 1, and they meet at the entrance to the library which is at the opposite end of the building of where registration is, down the stairs, but you probably already know that. However, they've added another tour, and we'll probably do this today and tomorrow, a building tour that will start at 11.30. That's the same time that lunch starts, so the idea being if you want to skip the long lines, take a tour of the building at 11.30, meeting, it's not on the agenda, that's why I'm handling it here, uh, meeting at the registration desk, all right? Uh, we've also put out more information about Seattle restaurants and attractions and information at the registration desk that if you registered yesterday or earlier today, you might not have seen or got. All right. Great. Well, let's, let's get to a conference here, right? But last thing I wanted to do for, for housekeeping is this is not a typical academic conference. Um, I, I know I can't see everybody in all the rooms, but how many people here are here for the first time? Oh my gosh, but I'm not surprised because I knew that. Uh, the point of this is, if you're here for the first time, you may not know that it's 
that the design of this conference has long breaks and long lunches because some of the most interesting stuff that happens isn't in the sessions. It's in the people who share your ideas or have similar, uh, well, it's the communities of practice, the things that do, the, 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 the things that other people do that are similar to yours. And, and they are willing, they have come to this conference to share their ideas. So don't be, uh, don't be shy about bumping into, into conversations or circles of people and thinking, well, I'm not part of this group. If you're here, you are, and I give you my permission to rudely interrupt in conversations and partake of them. As a matter of fact, everybody who was a first timer here, raise your hand again. All right, everybody who's not raising their hand, I want you to say, welcome to the conference to them. <laughs> welcome to the conference. Great, thank you. So our opening keynote plenary speaker, that's a long way of saying it, is Clay Shirky. Clay is an adjunct professor at the New York University Interactive Telecommunications Program, that's ITP, and he spends his time thinking about economic and cultural effects of the internet. Clay? Come on. Mm -hmm. Do I have to play those drums? <laughs> Only if you want. You can move them too. Yeah, just get them out of your way. <laughs> I'm not primarily going to talk about uh, technology this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk instead about the effects of technology on organizations, and particularly organizations that deal with information and have uh, mapping uh, information as a kind of organizational core. I'm not going to talk about the future, which sort of, uh, which, which may be a mistake. One of the great things about talking about the future is nobody can check your work while you're there. Uh, the other advantage about talking about the future is you can just extrapolate from present trends and say sort of uncontroversial but exciting things like, you know, in 2020, you're going to have a mainframe worth of power under your thumbnail, which, you know, what could be bad? But it's not actually that interesting. And you're like, sorry. It's not actually that interesting an observation. I want to talk instead about the present of organizations. Uh, in many cases, the, the pressures and the changes and the opportunities organizations face are because of technologies that have already happened. Right? We're dealing with the revolution having come and, and now spreading and the organizational effects, the pressures on the organization following on. There's a medieval story of a sword so sharp you can slice through a man's neck with it and he won't know until he goes to turn his head. And that, that in many ways is a metaphor for what's happening. You can, you can see this uh, with the, the RIA today, the Recording Industry Association of America. You know, in 99, 2000, they suddenly became aware that Napster was out there providing a completely alternate mode of reproduction and distribution of music. And they said, well, who's responsible for this? And one obvious answer is Sean Fanning is responsible for this. Sean Fanning invented Napster. But an equally accurate answer is that Claude Shannon is responsible for this. Claude Shannon, the father of information science. The RA's problems were caused by a researcher in Bell Labs prior to the Second World War. And the difference between Claude Shannon and Sean Fanning was essentially a set of implementation to the revolution happened long before it caught up with the RIA, and that, that is a lot of what is happening today. I'm going to start with the thesis that the data is the new, the data is the new book. Um, I am an unabashed purveyor and have been for a dozen years uh, of the idea that the Internet is the most important communications technology since the printing press. And I think that the comparison is accurate not just in its sort of technological, uh, not just in its technological aspect, in terms of a radical distribution of sort of new possibilities of production, but also in its effects on organizations. The printing press was in part fueled by the Catholic Church's reverence for the Bible. And the printing press returned the favor by destroying the church's monopoly on doctrine because newly cheap Bibles put, put the text directly in the hands of users and in particular in languages they could understand other than Latin. Now, anyone who's seen a, a hand-illuminated Bible and then seen a printed Bible side by side recognizes that the printed Bible is inferior in every respect except convenience. But that was enough. That was enough to transform the Catholic Church. In the 200 years after the printing press launched, the Church went from being a pan-European political force that was holding together the continent uh, to being one player among many, and the nation-state had arisen as a new form of organization. There's three, things I want to, there's three things about that transition that I want to draw your attention to because I think they're happening now. First of all, change was slow. Technological change is fast. Social and organizational change is slow. Anyone who was alive to see the launch of the printing press probably was not alive by the time Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door. Anyone who saw the 95 Theses go on the door wasn't around to see 
the rise of the nation state, which had then held Europe together for another three or 400 years. So these things take a long time to happen. Second, and as a corollary, things get broken and stay broken for a long time before they get fixed. For 200 years, the book broke more institutions than it saved. Right? There wasn't an orderly transition from the past to the future where organizations simply adapted. Right? Uh, you may remember Al Gore's uh, proposal that we build a bridge to the 21st century. Right? Turns out we got here anyway without the bridge. But that model of transition to the future along a sort of single linear path um, actually rarely happens at times of real technological change. Uh, that in fact what happened with the invention of the book was the old systems broke and it was apparent that they were broken before we knew what the new systems would be. And when the new systems were in place, we had a much more divergent set of organizations and organizational principles going on. So digital data is the new book and, and I've been uh, working on uh, the cultural and economic effects of digital data and of the internet for uh, a dozen years now. And here are the two things I know for sure about digital data. So the consistent surprise for me has been even when you think you're factoring in the effect of something that can be copied perfectly in unlimited f format, surprises within surprises continue to unfold. So I'm going to select an institution uh, to talk about the pressures of it and use that as an illustration for some of the larger, larger issues facing institutions today. So I'm going to take the library as the canary in the coal mine. The library, obviously, because uh, it's the place where the books are. That's the sort of historical conception of the library. It's an institution completely wrapped up in the printing press and now facing the new revolution. So here's the library's dilemma in a nutshell. This is a picture, I apologize for the poor quality, it was taken with a phone cam surreptitiously. Uh, this is a picture of the library. <laughs> uh, people are getting a little skeevy about photographs on the streets in New York. So um, This is uh, the library at 2nd Avenue and 6th uh, Street in Manhattan. And I want to call your attention to the fact that every place there is a terminal, there was a patron sitting at that terminal. And over here, uh, probably can't see that at the edge. Over here is a table for people waiting to sit at terminals. And then way up at the top there right, is somebody in the back. What's that person doing? They're, you know, looking at books. Right. One patron in the stacks and every single terminal filled plus a line waiting to get to the terminals. If you were an architect from Mars and you came down and you looked at the ground plan, you would say, why on earth is there so much floor space given over to the things the patrons aren't doing and so little floor space given over to the things the patrons are doing? Here's that same picture now redone as a graph. This is data from the California Digital Libraries. It runs the x-axis is from 19, 1991 to 2001. Uh, the y-axis is hundreds of thousands of users or accesses. The top graph uh, is in-house use of materials. Right? People who actually went to the physical library to do something. Right? Sharp, sharp increase, 91, 92, 93, then it goes flat, and by 97, it goes through a precipitate decline and now is monotonically declining. And this, is, this data is already three years old. Right? The middle graph is total circulation, physical circulation of paper. Again, up, 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 and then suddenly sharply down, and now beginning a gentle decline. The bottom graph is actually the most interesting to me. Reference requests were flat and moderately up, they take their only sharp, they take their only sort of demonstrably large dip in 1998, the year Google launches, and, and also begin a monotonic decline. So this is a place where users are simply opting out of the traditional library functions and opting into something else, and the library has to deal with that. But the first reaction of an institution faced with this kind of pressure is stop, right? Let's just stop this change because it's, it's inconvenient or it's, a, it's affecting us in negative ways and we don't like it. Uh, this, this happens over and over again. The economic logic of the age is unbundling, right? We have many examples of previously coherent institutions um, which are suddenly being taken apart because the axle of organization is being removed. You see it in the newspaper, right? What is a newspaper? It's the place where you get your news about the Iraq war and also school lunches, right? It's the place where you go to sell your kid's bicycle. Well, suddenly, Reuters can give you, the, give you the national news, eBay can take over the classified, and the newspaper begins to decohere as, a, as an institution. Right? That's the threat that libraries are under today, is a kind of decoherence. Right? And after a while, right, when the library begins to deal with this, you'll sit around having meetings, and this is actually true of any institution that faces these pressures, you'll sit around having meetings about what to do about this new challenge, and someone will come up with this idea. Right? It's the first reaction. 
Let's educate the users that what's going on isn't good for us, so let's go to the users and convince them to stop doing what they're currently doing and come back to the old way of doing things. Right? There are, you, will, you will run in today in library circles, you will run into librarians who are still rehearsing the speech. And the speech is the speech they're going to give when society comes into their office and says, you know, we've been doing this Google thing, but we're not really sure if it's a good idea, and what do you think? And the librarians launch into the speech about Google is fine for some things, but of course you need trained information professionals and so forth. And it's a fine speech, except they, they're never asked to give it because they have the wrong model of change. There's a consensus model of change, which is change happens when all of society comes together and decides that an organization is going to change. 100% acquiescence before the change happens. That's not what we're dealing with now. There's the voting model, which is 50% plus one, right? Half your users have to vote before you change. But in fact, what we're dealing with here is a market model, right? Institutions are in a market model for users. If you run a hardware store and Walmart moves into your town, you don't need 100% of your customers to shift to Walmart for you to be in trouble. You don't even need half your customers to shift. You need 10%, maybe 5%. And that's what the CDL graph is showing. One at a time, the users are opting out of traditional library services. And the library is never getting to make the counter argument because it's not a group effort. It's an individual effort. So the classic, the classic mode of expressing the desire to, to freeze development in the face of this kind of institutional pressure is always from the point of view, right? of the self-interest of, of the institution. Because they can't understand what it is the users see in the alternate method in the first place. Right? Every message that comes out of the sort of stop doing what you're doing effectively looks like this. Um, give you, tell you a story about institutional change that, that happened in this, in this mode. In the late 90s, the typographic union, the line of type operators union, held a meeting in New York City, and they did what they'd been talking about for years, which is they voted themselves out of existence. They held a vote, and they said, we're going to stop existing as a coherent unit. The few pensions we have to take care of, we're going to fold into the communication workers of America. And that's it. Right? A defining job of, the, of 20th century communications went away. Why did it go away? It went away because in 1984, Apple launched a computer that had font management on it. And it was the beginning of the desktop publishing revolution. And when it happened, the line of type operators looked at it and they laughed till milk came out their noses because it was terrible. It was just terrible. Anyone around in the late days remembers getting a birthday announcement that had nine fonts on it. You could barely read the thing, right? And then, right, when Mac was shipping, when, the, when Apple was shipping the manual with the computer, they were sort of explaining fonts to people and what they were, and they said, Different fonts are for different things. Don't use the ransom note font, for example, for business correspondence. Right? You had to explain that to users. Right? So the line type operators looked at this and said correctly, every aspect of this is inferior to professional typesetting. And they were almost right. Because it was every aspect except convenience. The users did not have to ask for help or permission, and they didn't have to pay anyone. And because the line of type operator's identity was a professional identity around we do services for you, they couldn't see that that was enough to precipitate a change that 15 years later caused themselves to vote themselves out of existence. This happens all the time with organizations. They get cognitive dissonance when facing change of this enormity. Here are three things that you believe about yourself. Right? And you believe them about yourself because all psychologically sound human beings believe them about themselves. Cognitive dissonance is the emotion you feel when some information comes in from the world that challenges one of these beliefs. Groups have these beliefs as well. And groups suffer cognitive dissonance whenever anything challenges one of these beliefs. You could see it in the music industry over and over again. Right? Our users love us. Right? We're purveyors of anarchic rock and roll energy. Right? And suddenly, anarchic rock and roll energy moves to the fact that the users can route around the music industry to distribute music, and they start to sound like, your mom, don't do that. No, that's not good. You know, Get back in the house, you kids. And one of the great tensions in the music industry was 
discovering that the users tolerated the industry's distribution of music when it was a service, when you couldn't get music any other way. But it wasn't an innate love for the industry itself. It was just as long as they were doing something valuable, the users were willing to put up with it. When that changed, when the technology that went underneath the music industry changed, there was a strong violation of that third characteristic. And in fact, that's still ratcheting through the system. We don't know how that one's going to play out, but the music industry has finally realized that their users no longer love them. And it's causing them profound pain because what used to be a service is now a barrier. Institutions going through this phase of development suffer from what I call the sadness of the scribe in the age of literacy. Imagine if you were a scribe and your principal skill was in knowing how to read and write. You love reading and writing. It's special. You get, you get great feedback for it. Not incidentally, it pays your rent. Uh, you help advance the world through exercise of your skill. And suddenly, other people start learning how to read and write. And you're a little bit caught because you love the skill. And so on one level, you're kind of happy to see other people doing it. And yet, if it becomes widely distributed, the specialness starts to go away. And so there's a tension between wanting the thing you do to be, be highly prized and wanting it to be scarce. It's the tension the Catholic Church felt in the face of the Bible. The Bible is a wonderful thing, and yet if everyone has one, what's so special about the church as the place where the Bible is? This is the iron law of groups. Whatever a group's founding principle is, its core mission is always job two. And job one is self-preservation. And when the founding mission and self-preservation conflict, they will change their mission rather than change their will towards self-preservation. In Washington, D.C. right now, AccuWeather is petitioning the federal government to prevent the National Weather Service from making raw data available online. Because AccuWeather's job is to take scarce and hard to distribute resources and get them out to the public. And if those resources stop being scarce and hard to distribute, AccuWeather is going to go out of business. And so AccuWeather's stated goal is to get weather to the public, and yet if that can happen without AccuWeather, they're not interested. Right. And I don't, I don't mean to pick on AccuWeather. That's an absolutely normal case for groups. That's just, it's what human groups do. The transition is subtle, but this is what it looks like. You go from saying, because we manage scarce resources on behalf of the society, we are a special tribe, to we're special. Right? That becomes definitional. And you, you act to preserve the scarcity, even in the, favor, even in the face of the threat of abundance. So this, this is this long, kind of uh, drawn out facing the difficulties with novel methods of reproduction and distribution. When groups go through this, they only change under extreme duress. Libraries have been under extreme duress. The, again, the, the, the photograph and the chart I showed is apparent to everyone. For a decade, libraries have been dealing with this. So there's a second model of change. Once you realize, no, we can't stop this. The second model of change, which is to manage a transition. In this model, you, you assess your strengths and weaknesses, and you go with the strengths. You lead the transition into the new era with the strengths. Now, earlier I said libraries are replaced where the books are, but of course that's a really third grade conception of a library. In fact, libraries have an enormous number of high order skills, and one of them is classification. Libraries are fantastically good at creating ontologies. Librarians are fantastically good at creating ontologies. At a series of globally applicable, non-overlapping buckets into which all human thought can be slotted. And many librarians now are, are moving into a world where that is the skill that they are leading with. Right? This is the Library of Congress categorization for science, top level categories. Right? You're going to take this ontology and apply it to digital data to bring the same kind of order you brought to the books on the shelf to the digital world. Uh, and this is a profound pattern, this idea of, of global but non-overlapping buckets. You see it all over. This is, this is a, a, a cladistic map. The, the evolutionary tree happens to be of lentils. Uh, but this is the evolutionary tree where you can actually see right, the, the higher order buckets of lentilness as we get the different species. Uh, and you can absolutely group them. Or periodic table of the elements, again, another place where uh, you, you, by analyzing what's there, you apply some kind of high order to this. And this is a great example of how old expertise can potentially be applied to new situations. 
But back to rule one, digital data is weirder than you understand. The problem with this model is it's not going to work. We're already seeing places where that expertise of the libraries is not, in fact, directly applicable. I showed you the Library of Congress top-level categorization for science. I want to show you a couple of other classification schemes, uh, pieces of classification schemes. Here, one of my favorite is the Dewey Decimal Scheme for religion, uh, the top-order categorizations for religion. Oops. <laughs> Not the categorization you want in 2004. Uh, now, it's easy to look at this and say, well, poor Benita Dewey, he was operating at a certain time and in a certain cultural context and so forth. We can, you know, we know better than that now. But here's some other ones that you can pull out of the Library of Congress classification. Philosophy, psychology, religion as a top-level category, or my favorite. Geography, maps, anthropology, recreation, because <laughs> why not, right? We've got, we've got diseases of the ear, nose, and throat as a top-level or a high-level category. We don't have oncology. We don't have the study of cancer because when the Dewey Decimal System, I'm sorry, when the Library of Congress classification system was invented, uh, cancer was considered to be an aspect of individual specializations and not, in fact, a particular behavior of the genes. Under engineering, top level category for roads and pavement, nothing for the internet. And my favorite, these are literally RST, three in order, right, for the Library of Congress's classification for writings about geographies and regions. Where'd you go on your vacation? Well, you know, Sarajevo, Asia. So this kind of problem happens in classification schemes over and over. And the problems are many. There are multiple categories. Consider chess, bicycling, football. Two are athletic, one is not. Two are games, one is not. Two are sports, one is not. And yet, there's no clean way to completely either group or separate those categories, which is why you get lumpy things like recreation. Sometimes categories disappear, right? There was a category in the Library of Congress, uh, top level category in the Library of Congress for literature about East Germany. The historical literature lives there, but what do you do now when some, someone is writing about Leipzig? Do you shel shelve it with the old East German category or do you shelve it with the German category? Soviet Union, their library classification scheme, the top level category was the science of Marxist-Leninism. That's probably not there anymore. So you get this kind of drift. Um, psychology, religion, philosophy together as a category. When you're thinking about William James and Sigmund Freud, you can make an argument that those things go together. But there would be practitioners in each of those fields who would strongly object to being lumped with the other two. And context, of course. The Balkans as compared with Asia and Africa as top-level categories. The Balkan Peninsula. So if these problems are endemic, and librarians know they're endemic. This isn't, this isn't a mystery to the classification problem. Why do we have classifications at all? Why has this been something that libraries have been working on for hundreds of years? Turns out that this kind of classification scheme, an ontology, is actually a really lousy way of classifying ideas. But it's a great way of classifying things. The two examples I show earlier, which are, which are robust and adopted across the spectrum, are actually physical realities. There is DNA in those lentils that can be sequenced, and the sequence can be turned into a historical derivation. Right? There are protons at the center of those atoms, and you can count them, and you can organize them by the count. Right? Ontology works well with things. It works badly for ideas. So why did libraries adopt ontology? Because for a long time, ideas have been instantiated in things. Even when you think you're dealing with a high order and abstract skill like classification, it turns out to be related to the physical aspect of the book. Our concern with ontology is actually a 500 year patch to two particular problems. One, a book has to go somewhere on the shelf. Right? It has to have a physical location. And once it has one physical location, it can't have another different one. And two, once you own more than a couple hundred books, you can't remember where they are. Right? And those seem laughably trivial problems. Right? Everybody understands those problems. Let's talk about something high order. But in fact, the high order classification schemes, the librarian's worldview, is largely around solving those two problems. Right? I remember the moment where I flipped on the index. I picked up a copy of Naked Lunch, William Burroughs' book, and I was looking for a little piece in it called Hauser and O'Brien. It's a tiny little sort of... Uh, true or film noir vignette about two-thirds of the way through the book and I picked it up thinking I would find this quote from it and I opened it up I'd been 
at that point, I was going to say a Usenet user, but in fact addicted to Usenet for, I don't know, a year and a half. And I looked at the book and I thought, I can't grab for the string. I, I, I have to turn the physical pages and, and look, I can't, I can't find, I just can't type Apple F and find what I'm looking for. And suddenly the muteness of the book in my hand hit me like a ton of bricks. Full text search means the index goes away because you can find what you want by finding it. You don't need a proxy. In the same way, but at a much higher order, the URL, the universal resource locator, makes the need for classification schemes go away because the physical problems, the book has to be somewhere, and unless you have a classification scheme, you can't remember where it is, have gone away as well. Now, it would be very easy Right. To indulge in the, well, you know, analog institutions, hopeless historical legacy, all these hotshot digital institutions, of course, they get it. Right. But the really profound thing is they don't get it either. Right. This is a classification scheme from Yahoo. Right. Yahoo gets it more than Yahoo. It's hard to remember now because they're just purveyors of ads. But back in the day, <laughs> Yahoo was the home team. Right? They were the people who got the web, and everything they did felt right, felt native. And Yahoo started as a directory. They started with the librarian's impulse to classify. They had a professional ontologist on staff. Right? Is that a great business card? Head ontologist of Yahoo. They had 14 top-level categories. When they classified a URL, it went somewhere. Right? It went into one of these categories. So you'll see here. Um, these are additional categories in uh, art. And you'll see art weblogs, arts therapy, booksellers, and cultural policy have a little at sign behind them. And what the at sign means is this link isn't really here. It's elsewhere. Right? It's formally in another classification scheme, but we've added a pointer to it here so you could find it. Right? Now, why did Yahoo say that a URL had to go somewhere? And I could keep doing the double quotes for the rest of the talk, but I won't. Go and somewhere in, in quotes. And the reason they did that was not anything having to do with the URL or with digital data. It was because classification schemes, as we have understood them, require an analog for physical location. They treated URLs as if they were books. Right? But then they add this symlink thing, right, where cultural policy... I presume is located actually in policy comma cultural and art weblogs are weblogs comma art. Right? But then you have this sim link here so the users can find them. But what's the difference between a link to the data and the data when the data itself is a link? And Yahoo set an additional policy of, oh, you can only have something linked to from three other places. Well, why such a low number? Because if you start just letting anything link to anything else, chaos will ensue. Right? The hierarchy will go away, and our ability to treat this as if it were books and to enforce a top-level ontology will be destroyed. And so Yahoo took digital data, and they backed it into a book-like organization method, and it didn't work. It stopped working. It's hard to remember now of Google, because of the hype about the IPO has made it seem like a near-term dot-com play, but Google saved the web from choking in its own waste. And they saved it by throwing out ontology altogether and by throwing out an artificial distinction between URLs go in categories but are linked to in other categories. And they said it's all links. Users are producing their own metadata. The metadata is the link. You don't need, you don't need a priori classifications. You don't need tagging. In fact, Google specifically gathers the meta tags and then ignores them because they're worse than useless. They're typically users trying to game the system or operating in their own context and not understanding the context of the search. And what Google did was it set aside the Yahoo model entirely and said the corpus can, can be treated as a whole without needing to classify in advance. And value can be derived post hoc because the users are, are creating their own metadata, which we can read. Right. Now Google, in one of the few missteps they made, uh, in 1999, decided that to compete with Yahoo, they were going to add a browsing capability on top of the search capability. And so they licensed DMOZ, the, the uh, open directory project, which was meant to compete with Yahoo's ontology. And A, almost no one used it. 
Google had on their front page a browse option, and almost no one used it. But B, more to the point, what little use there was declined over time. Ontology has consistently lost out to ad hoc extraction of value and treating the user's metadata as valid. Right? You can classify in narrow ranges. Right? If you go to an individual website, you'll see strong classification schemes. But by the time you get global, it is both philosophically and practically impossible to apply a classification scheme. And Google got where it is today by not just recognizing that, but working with it. So earlier I said, books have to go somewhere on the shelf, and if you have too many books, you can't remember where they are. Those seem so trivial. And yet, books are the library's hidden problem. And they're hidden in the way the purloined letter was hidden. They're hidden right out in the open. Everyone can see that that is an organizing principle of how libraries are set up, as with the picture, right? The amount of dedication to stack space versus the position of the users. And people want to think that there are a bunch of high-order problems that are separate from the hidden problems. But in a way, if you change the hidden problem, if you find the core organizational principle that, a, that, a, that an institution has wrapped itself around, like an oyster making a pearl around a grain of sand, and if you change that hidden problem, you will change more about the institution than any high-order operation. I, I, said I was using libraries as an avatar of the problem, not, not in fact as the target of the talk, because many institutions, in fact any institution that deals with information has some set of hidden problems. The entire organizing principle of the Federal Communications Commission is that spectrum is scarce. Right? There are still commissioners who believe that. You can take them into a room with 20 Wi-Fi nodes operating, and you can connect your computer to one of the 20 and not suffer from interference from the other 19. And they, they literally won't believe you, right? Their attitude is it will work in practice but not in theory. And it, that is because the notion of scarcity of spectrum is the central organizing principle of the FCC. And if spectrum becomes not scarce, they are going to have a really profound problem figuring out who they should regulate and how. The RA, we've talked about the music industry. Music is hard to distribute. But also, it's hard to know what people will like. The music industry also performs a taste-making function, except that collaborative filtering tools are actually starting to allow users to find and recommend music to one another. Lucas Gons, a, a, a colleague of mine in New York, has launched a service called WebJ, and it's really nothing other than playlists. It's user-shareable playlists. But because you can track the popular songs across playlists, or say, if this guy put together a playlist that I liked, I'll, I'll get other things from him. And the good music starts to bubble up as if it was the charts, except no charts. Right? The users are doing it for themselves. Right? Colleges and universities, of course. Two, two critical aspects. We have more books than you do. And you have to come to, get, you have to, come to where we are to talk in small groups. Right? Both of those are now suspect. Right? There are obviously lots and lots of high order aspects of being in a college or university. But in fact, those organizing principles set a lot of what the physical four-year classic undergraduate education looks like. And both of those principles are coming under pressure. It's so not to say these institutions are going to go away. Right? But they are going to come under the kind of pressure that is going to defeat both the stop and the orderly transition methods of dealing with these problems. So I talked about two possible strategies institutions can adopt in the face of radical change. I want to talk about now, now about a third. Here's a painting uh, by Bastien Lepage. It's Joan of Arc. Uh, it was painted in 1879. It's a big painting. The screen here doesn't do it justice. It's six by eight. Uh, it's at the Met in New York. And one of the really striking things about this painting is it is, to our eyes, photographic in its execution. Joan's face is in focus. Uh, there's depth of field effects. The trees are in less focus than Joan's face. Right? So we, we while simultaneously recognizing as a photo, we can also understand the photographic uh, construction of the composition here. Here's another painting. Mondrian, who else? Uh, 1921, uh, the year in which he finally said, OK, I see where this train is going, and I'm going to take it express instead of local. Right? He had been working on degrees of abstraction, painting trees in which the, the branches overlapped and sort of created, started to create these abstract patterns. And he finally said, you know what? Forget the trees. <laughs> I'm just going to go with the patterns. Right? 
If you didn't know that these were both European painters, not only would you not expect that they were in the same culture, you wouldn't even expect that they called their job the same thing. And yet, these were two people working in an unbroken tradition, and the paintings are less than a generation apart. You go from this to this in a generation. What happened in between? Well, you know what happened. The camera happened. The camera came along and said, if you're painting photographically, I've got something that will do you one better. Right? But instead of the linotype operator strategy, right, the painter strategy was to adopt a brilliant counter move, which is to say, we're not going to talk about high order functions. We're going to talk about low order functions. What do we got? We got pigment and we got canvas. What can we do with that that we haven't thought of before? Forget all this stuff about drawing figures in space. Forget all this stuff we knew about the re from the Renaissance about one and two point perspective. The camera's beaten us to that. The high order stuff has gone away. What we should really be talking about is how can we take the primitive elements that we are good at and combine them into something new. In 1879, if you'd asked what painting was, they would say painting is the pictorial representation of people, places, and things. By 1921, if you'd asked the same question, a painter is someone who makes flat art. That's the description of painting by this point. And it was a brilliant counter move because it saved, it saved the profession from the onslaught of the camera, not by trying to reapply high order forces. There was a group that said, well, we'll do the high order things, but we'll do them in the ways the camera can't. Right? And so they went, a whole branch of French painting went into historical scenes, you know, Cleopatra with the asp or the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Right? And it all looked photographic and it was all pretty dreadful. Uh, because they were trying to, to simply take the way they were already comfortable working and apply it to a new medium. And a handful of people went in the direction of discomfort. That is a third possible strategy. It is rare, but in a way it is the thing that changed the world much more than simply trying to arrange orderly institutional transition. But this is the other meaning of the present of organizations, right? Not just the current time for organizations in the world, but the gift of organizations, the present that we have gotten from digital data and from the new flexibility in handling it, means that we can create with we can experiment with really radical forms. Right? That 50, 50 years from now, no one is going to look back and ask how well we did either stopping the onslaught of digital data in our organizations, nor are they going to ask how well we did shepherding our organizations into some sort of orderly future. They're only going to ask how well we used the radical flexibility that's been put at our disposal. Right? I'm not talking to everybody in, in these rooms, but I may be talking to you. You know that weird idea you have? The might or might not work, and your colleagues would think you were odd for trying it? Try it. Right? It probably won't work. You're right about that part. Most new ideas don't, but it'll be better than just sitting around waiting for things to break, which is what's going to happen. Because in really major transitions, more things break than get fixed, and they stay broken for a long time. And the new stuff that gets invented only gets invented when people try radical alternatives. And trying new things is a better way of having new ideas than just sitting around watching your institution come under increasing pressure. Because the, the message of the time that we've got right now is you can be a linotype operator or you can be a painter. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yeah. Done. <laughs> We're sitting here in the magnificent William H. Gates building. I know I wasn't even allowed to use my Mac. <laughs> is, is closed source the library of 2004? Well, uh, for, first of all, I should say of libraries, there's a whole, obviously, a whole spectrum. Um, I, one of the most interesting things to me about the library world is, is Sims in Berkeley, um, School of Information Management. Um, is what a library school looks like if the word library isn't in uh, the title. And in fact, there was, there was talk of not accrediting them as a library school because they didn't focus enough on the classic library. Um, 
Yes, there is. So, so in, in some cases in the institutional culture of the library, there is the attitude that it, it's, it's, it's closed stacks. It's frozen, uh, you know, it's academic publishing. It's read Elsevier charging you $10,000 for a chemical abstract. So it's not just the library. It's in many ways the publishing industry as a whole um, is designed to preserve a kind of scarcity that puts them in the role of gatekeeper, which is exactly the, which is exactly the closed source model. And over and over again, the, the transition that I look for is the place where the new thing is inferior in every aspect of the old thing, except it's more convenient for the users. And when a librarian says, well, you know, you would certainly rather do a search, you know, sitting next to a trained, you know, a trained information retrieval specialist. Well, yes, except that it's two in the morning and the papers do, right? I can't get to that person. So convenience is enough to flip people from closedness to openness. Um, the, that battle is going to be fought over and over, and I don't think that there's going to be a one-size-fits-all answer, but it's, you know, it's, it's plainly being fought in the uh, academic publishing world between, say, public library of science versus closed, uh, closed journals. It's plainly being published, as, as you say, in the open source versus closed source world. But one of the continual surprises in the current age is that users are actually much more tolerant of direct access to raw material than anyone thought they would be, and that the need for interpretive layers between the users and the raw material is actually much thinner than people thought it would be. And that once you remove the, the priesthood of interpreters, all kinds of schemes to help users can come up, um, some of which don't, don't involve actual, uh, you know, sort of professional accreditation at all. So did that. You're speaking to a lot of lawyers when you're talking about information in their intermediate. Right. No, I know. And it's, and it's actually and one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, LexisNexis is the new, you know, it's, it's, in a way, it's the church. It's the, it's the closed bottleneck. And the assumption is... You know that there are there are interpretive modes that can't be understood by the by the user. We're seeing in the medical profession now people showing up in the doctor's office with reams of things they've printed out from the network. I don't know whether this is true in lawyers' offices or not, but I'm sure that that at least for simple transactions. In fact, I do know it's true because my parents just did a will and they largely did it online. They said they researched it, they decided what they want, and they went to the to the lawyer not because they needed the advice or the help. They needed the signature. Right? The, one, the one leftover bit of scarcity was they can't put comma ESQ period after their names when they sign the document. So we're already seeing low-level pressure on that kind of scarcity right there. And it, it becomes, um, at the very least, a problem of co-interpretation because the direct access to the material is growing. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, d I don't mean to suggest that Google is the, is the be-all and end-all. Um, just that the, the previous method of trying to slot things in advance wasn't working. Google's working now on narrowing shells of context so that uh, there's, a, there's now a personal Google search where you list your interests so that if you're interested in cars but not computers, a search on Jaguar will likely bring you the car than either the animal or the Apple operating system. Um, so that's, that's one way to add user context to the mix. Um, there's also some speculative work on essentially um, declaring your own, uh, your own expert panel. Google co convenes uh, basically a post hoc peer review uh, using something they call PageRank, where they scan the uh, link structure and they find the links that seem to have expertise because they have a, 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 a large number of outbound links and a large number of inbound links point to them. What Google can't do is say, this user particularly trusts this set of links. Uh, but there's a possibility that you can go through and essentially nominate, right? If, if to take the weblog world, if I could go through and say, anything that David Weinberger or Mark Pilgrim or Joel Spolsky points to, you should push up in the Clay Shirky version of PageRank so that you can start to, uh, you can start to narrow in your search from there. Um, but search is, uh, it's an arms race. Um, and it's an arms race in part with people who are trying to gain the system to get higher in the search rankings, of course. Um, but it's mostly just an arms, arms race with volume, right? That any strategy that works at a sort of 95, 5% separation will work for a while until the 5% becomes unmanageably large. So um, there is, yes, a lot, of, a lot of additional work in either allowing you directly or to nominate uh, other people to be context for you. Um, but I, I, I haven't seen anything that 
that makes as remarkable an improvement over current search technology as, as Google did over the classification scheme. Yes, ma'am. So the, the distinction, I think, between the Lexus argument and, and this is essentially supply and demand side. Uh, Lexus was making a change on the supply side. Um, what we're seeing with Google instead is a change on the demand side. Um, users are simply opting out. Right? It's not a question of Google partnering with anyone. Um, they're simply reading the data that's there, and they're giving it to the users in a way that no no counter argument is convincing the users to opt out. And the fact that there's a pool of users who would rather have a classification scheme than direct access isn't enough to stem the tide. That's what I meant about consensus and voting, right? This is, this is a place where, um, you know, the CDL charts, right? For, for all the arguments about the value of the library, the users are voting with their feet. They're not, they're not actually buying it. And so, I don't think that there's anything that can be done on the supply side to stem the change. And I don't think that there's anything that can be done um, to restore classification to its, previous, to its previous state. Classification is both philosophically inadequate globally for the, for the, the reasons I, I talked about in the, in the list of classification schemes, but it's also it's just physically impossible at this scale of data. You can't classify a priori. Um, one of the other breaks Yahoo had was they started hand classifying links, and that took too long. And then they started automatically classifying links, and then that took too long. So you could certainly have a classification scheme in a narrow and well-managed corpus of literature. But once the users want access to a body of literature that's too large or too dynamic or too heterogeneous to classify, the, the, the sort of comparison of classification and direct access becomes, becomes adverse to classification. So I think, I don't think that there's a supply side argument to be made here. I think that the two pressures are users opting out, whatever, whatever the upstream arguments might be, and classification not, not just breaking at, at large scale.
In, no, yes, and, and I, I, should, I should make it clear that, right, that you can have controlled vocabularies in specialized areas. But, but it, so it, let, let me give you two. There, there was a moment where David Geffen, trying to understand the Internet, said, Amazon, Amazon, I don't get this Amazon thing. I want a book. I tell my secretary. What's the problem? Right? The, the looking, at, looking at the users of LexisNexis as lawyers who are passing the bills along to the clients or physicians who are passing along to the cost of doing business already misses the gap. In a way, there's a special class of users for whom payment for this access is already built into the system. It ignores the, the larger class. But even within the idea of controlled vocabularies, right, the medical profession is still uh, strongly resistant to controlled vocabularies in things like uh, health level seven uh, record keeping, right? The, the, the continuity of care record, the CCR record, right, has gotten traction in part because it allows the doctors to do free text entry. So even there, uh, ontology in a, in a managed zone is still in strong tension with um, uh, user-created data, and it's, it, it seems to me that we're going to get kind of in miniature the same kind of, kind of tension. Now, the smaller you get, the easier it is to manage ontology, but even at the size of a field like medicine, they've been unable to get a controlled vocabulary that applies to the whole thing. So I think, I think the pressures are, are, are repeating themselves even there. Yeah. And if you, then, you, then you get that privacy bump, because it's just a bump, because right. the system actually already knows a lot about us, right. but we haven't allowed it to connect up. Right. But as soon as it starts saying, here's relevant information before right. you even have to fill right. out long forms, right. we're going to say, well, that's convenient, right. and so it's going to be sort of a mass deprivatization of information. <laughs> Well, it, de it depends on how much Google links it with your other, other real-world things. But, but there's, a, there's a version of that now in the sort of personal.google.com. I think that it's, if you go to Google Ads, you'll see it where you can declare your, your interest. I think it's on a cookie, though. I don't think you give them your name. Uh, but there's another service out called Delicious, D-E-L dot I-C-I-O dot U-S, which is a social bookmark manager. You save your bookmarks there and tag them. The tagging scheme is completely freeform, so any covalence between two users' set of tags is emergent. It's not top-down, it's bottom-up classification. And that becomes a place where other users you watch or other tags you watch become a valuable stream of information without needing... Um, it's, it's, it's in the direction you're talking about. If it's got a social context to it, but it doesn't require a priori classification. And so it's a way to extract value rather than to, to make a place to slot, to slot things in. A delicious, D-E-L dot I-C-I-O dot U-S. Right, and the Amazon book recommendations, exactly, exactly right, where it's not, again, there's not uh, classification, it's just, you know, we're... Right, right. And, and to the... So what if my credit card company, Amazon, and a few other places that have, well, let's say, Jewel Foods, where I have my... my, my credit right. card. Uh, and Walmart gets together, chunks their data, and then I go do a Google right. search. It's going to be a lot different. Right. And I know everybody, all the privacy hackles are going up, but I'm going to think... Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, in a way, what you just described is what, what the, the Total Information Awareness Project was trying to do with. Um, and, and in a way, they should have just called it, you know, either the Partial Database Interoperability Project, because that's really all it was. Or maybe they should have called it Fluffy Bunny or something, just to kind of disarm the, the secret decoder ring sound of Total Information Awareness. But that, that ability to collate the contents of databases is still um, a potential but largely unrealized possibility.
Right. Right, there, and, and there certainly are still there's certainly still value for categorization at the narrow, at the narrow level. When you can have a controlled vocabulary, when you can say in advance these are the important sources, then you've got and it's and it's uh, humanly tractable to classify, then you can deal with it. It's 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 in part a problem of scale, but I'm also predicting that over time the LexisNexis model is going to start breaking, uh, because we're starting to see people move outside the traditional publishing model. Um, there is, a, there is an effort now to create the Public Library of Science, which is essentially science articles published into the public domain on the, on the rationale that, in many cases, tax dollars have already paid, been paid for um, with the research. And what they're discovering is that articles whose full text is available online to Google get cited more often than articles whose full text is only available in closed search engines. So... If, if you say there's a problem with authoritative source, there is a problem. But a lot of users don't, aren't saying that. One of the big surprises for libraries is users are actually better able to sort between authoritative, non-authoritative, and partially authoritative than they thought. One of the other problems is many of the authoritative sources are actually wrong. There was a fascinating, uh, fascinating, <laughs> fascinating rip through a bunch of science magazines recently in which they said the conclusions they put and the articles are not substantiated by the data sets they submitted. And there's already too much data for that kind of human checking. So they just did a spot check. In many cases, the authorities are the authorities, not because they're correct, but because they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones managing the scarce resources. So I'm not saying that this is, this is going to happen tomorrow. Change takes a long time. But the push in the direction of authority not as a binary condition, but as a spectrum, right? And the decisions about authoritativeness being placed in the hands of the user rather than the gatekeeper are two things that users are opting in for in ways that um, the people in the, in the gatekeeper position are, are, are not able to stop. Okay. Clay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's have a break. And then on to the next session at 10.30.